voices, the things they said, voices, some from those dead, all the voices heard, voices, the things we say, voices, they're in your head, all the voices heard. Every time we talk about communists, I, I think about sort of the history within our country and, and how people like to have their discourse on communists. And one, <laughs> of my favorite, one of my favorite things that people do is just like, do you know that communism has killed 500 million people? Or like, do you know how com communism has killed seven squillion people? <laughs> Right. It's always a different sure. number. And right. It, it's always like, you know, there's not even a squillion people on Earth. Um, <laughs> well, that's because of no. communism, though. That, that's right. That's why. There used to be. There used to be seven squillions yeah. of people. That damn communism, though. Mm -hmm. took, them out, took them out. But then when you go back and look at the history of it and you see the kind of people that actually were communists, especially like during the, the 1930s, 20s, you know, when, when the whole concept was, was rising on a workers movement, right? right. Um, it, was, it was like all the best like artists and like, you know, some of the great thinkers. Um, and it's always fascinating to me that, that we still sort of, the stigma still sticks, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when you read about the Spanish Civil War, it's it's sort of front and center there. Um, and I guess just to start with a little background on the Spanish Civil War, it, it was a three year war between World War Two and World War One. Um, and for the first time really ever. Uh, in like 1931, uh, the war was between 36 and 39. But in 1931, they finally, the people of Spain were able to topple the the monarchy as well as the Catholic Church. With the, those two, effectively ran the show in Spain forever. And it was that all of them being very rich and everyone else being very poor. And then you know folks started speaking up in favor of, of elections and having a republic, right, where representatives were representing you in office. Um, so all of this took place. They did have elections. Um, and let me go up to my notes. So in 1931, they had the Constitution and elections. Uh, that during that time, actually, the sort of progressives, the the people of, for the republic, right? So, it was a lot of uh, it was not just moderates; it was socialists. There were communists. Um, there were anarchists too on that side. I'm not sure if there were many in office. That kind of it feels a little off message for anarchism. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I see that. <laughs> yeah, but maybe I'm misunderstanding it. So I don't know. But they were in office for two years. And then what they ended up doing was dismantling the church, uh, really pushing it out of Spain. Uh, like I said, they got rid of the monarchs. Um, but then 1933 rolled around. Uh, and one of the things that they really had fucked up on was they kicked all the Jesuits out of Spain. And Jesuits being like, uh, sort of like, the the academic the academia arm of of the church uh so they had a shortage of teachers and half the country couldn't read or write and so parents were really pissed off about that because they had no one to teach their kids so uh women actually gained suffrage in 33 and on the wave of this you know we need the church back to you know first of all we are religious and we want to be able to teach our kids the nationalists uh came back into power the fascists they were only in power it was very short-lived though <clears throat> um till 1936 right um i i think i was going to start 
with whining about capitalists, but I, I guess why don't I just give the pre-war uh, background now? Yeah. Um, so after the nationalists took over in 33, uh, Franco kind of had the, the arm of the military and that's Francisco Franco, who eventually went on to be the fascist dictator uh, in Spain up until the 70s uh, after the end of the war. Spoiler alert. Um, but in 1934, there was a revolt of miners in this uh, province called Asturias. Franco killed 2,000 of them, uh, wounded several thousand others. And that's when the Spanish workers... You know, and as we all know, the worker movement that's always tied so closely with socialism and communism, the workers started referring to him as the butcher. Well, after that happened, uh, there was an election in 1936. The liberal republic folks took power again, right? So 36 is the time when all of this war really starts up. Now, around this time, I've, and the reason I wanted to, to have this discussion today is because there are some like really interesting correlates between today and back then. Right. Um, so like, you know, you look at the fighting that's going on in the streets of our cities today. Who is it between? I mean, there's the left and then there are the fascists. Yeah, it's, it's the, the left, the anti-fascists. And then the straight up fascists, the far right fascists. And that was the same in the streets uh, before these wars, you know, 85 years ago. It was never the libs uh, out there in hand to hand combat against the fascists in the streets. Uh, That's a giant shock. Yeah, I, I don't know what they were doing. I guess they were, you know. Uh, saying that we should shoot them. I'm the sure they were, yeah, tone policing the left. Mm -hmm. If I know libs. Right, precisely. Oh, and you do. <laughs> I've and seen your Twitter. <laughs> that's the one that drives me nuts because, you know, it, you saw... So 36, the election happens, and then you start seeing these skirmishes in the streets between, uh, in all the major cities between the far left, uh, you know, sort of socialists and communists and anarchists, and the far right, the, the, the full on fascists. Um, and everyone else is sort of like, oh, what, what on earth shall we do, right? Um, very similar to today. Uh, not only that, this is all starting up eventually. So Franco, once they took power again, once the Republic took power again, the elected people, they were like, well, we don't know what to do with all of these fascist military leaders. Like we don't want to just kill them. So what they ended up doing was putting them in posts in like really far away places and just like being like, I mean, I guess we can let them rot there. So they put Franco out in the Canary Islands just hoping he wouldn't do anything. But then he and two other generals decided to, to start a, a fascist revolution, have a coup. And so they started that in 36. And during this time, the folks who came to Franco's aid were the two other major fascist countries in Europe, that being Benito Mussolini's Italy and Adolf Hitler's Germany. Guess who came to the aid of the Republic people, the, the folks who are the loyalists, who are the, you know, the, the libs, socialists, communists, and anarchists? Who? Well, I'll tell you who didn't. It was the capitalist Americans. Uh, they immediately said, you know, we don't like fascism, but... We also really don't like communists. Uh, so uh, we don't think that we can fight fascism right now. So we're going to sit this one out. Not only that, but the U.S. government told Americans, anyone who sneaks into Spain to fight uh, will face like a $9,000 fine, which is a wild fine at that time. Yeah. In the 30s. Yeah. What, it's like. $20 million by today's standards. Or yeah. It's like, like it, a million bajillion dollars. It's a squillion. A squillion. It's a squillion, yeah. yeah. 
to my I was I was doing the calculations in my head and I I came up with just over a squillion dollars. Yeah. Yeah, that's something. Yeah. That's that's more dollars than uh communism is killed. Yeah. Or about a seventh, I guess. <laughs> So I already <laughs> forgot about that connection and was like, what the fuck is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Let me take a drink of my coffee. But so the, the filthy capitalists in the U.S. refuse to come out. I mean, other stuff's going on, too, where it, there's a Great Depression happening uh, and it's affecting the entire world. Uh, we are a f- barely two decades removed from World War II one and uh people are just not ready to to fight again right Um, spanish flu happened right after world war one as well and so everyone's everyone's feeling a little depleted at that point um but a major part of it was just that the u.s didn't like the capitalists didn't like communists well it just changed right exactly but the communists actually did end up working very hard to support the republic movement and not only like it they it it was a whole amalgam of political ideologies coming together and saying listen we don't like fascism we don't like fascists we're going to fight it right it's not just the communists um which is part of what makes this whole thing kind of frustrating because you know, you, you want to think that if the, re, the Republic, if the, the, the people who are for, uh, you know, elections in Spain, when that's that war, does World War II end up happening in the way that it does, right? Um, so the, uh, the communists, you know, they've got communist party factions in countries all over the world. So they put out a lot of effort to get people to come and fight for uh, democracy in Spain to be a part of that and to help, you know, help, help out, uh, in these people's fight for freedom. Right. And they end up succeeding in getting a good number of people out to the war. Let me, the, the total numbers are that the international brigade, and that was made up of a good number of communists, but it was also just people of all political stripes that were fighting against fascism, you know? Uh, there was a lot of interest in the West by a lot of writers and a lot of artists. Uh, Hemingway was famously out there covering all of this. Um, and the head of the Lincoln Brigade, who it, that was the, it's actually the battalion, but everyone just called it the brigade. Um, that was the American forces fighting out there. His name was Robert Hale Merriman. Uh, he is basically the character that is uh, the main character in For Whom the Bell Tolls is built around. Oh, well, I didn't know that. I want to make sure it's the, that book. Sorry, I'm pausing. Yes, that is correct. All right. Sometimes I mix that up with um, A Farewell to Arms, which I believe was World War II. So Hemingway was out there. Uh, You had a lot of other people, a lot of other great writers were out. Well, great uh, is a relative term, but uh, people who had, whose writing has reverberated through the the, the, the decades. You know, you had George Orwell out there. Um, Orwell famously survived a sniper bullet through the neck. Uh, I believe that was in 1937. Um, yeah, there were just uh, a lot of American interests, a lot of Western interests in this, right? And Orwell, of course, was British, I think, so not American. But Hemingway was actively working to to have a radio show broadcast in the U.S. to increase people's excitement about this war, to get more funding to come out there, to to be able to fight the fascists, and to get more Americans to come out and and volunteer in the war. So it it was, you know, Hemingway really isn't known for being like a wild-eyed leftist, but like he was very much a part of this effort as well. Um, But long story short, the U.S. refused to be a part of it. 
And so in 1936, in New York City, kind of in the southern end of Manhattan, all of these uh, these army surplus stores, you know those stores, right? Where mm-hmm. they sell oh, army yes. gear for like, you know, small prices and like a lot of like, a lot of hip teenagers will go and buy clothes there. Right. Mm-hmm. Or like ammunition, old school ammunition boxes. Whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Your lunchbox. So- Little by little, these uh, these young men started trickling into New York and buying all of this like stuff from the the army surplus stores, and you know just like not not just clothing but also gear, canteens, blah blah blah, and um, you know it, it kind of became this open secret that these were uh, young Americans going to fight in the war. And the Communist Party in the U.S. actually did have something to do with that. Communist Party in the U.S. uh, around that time was really interesting. Uh, I don't know if a lot of people know about it, but it was one of the major things. It it fought hard against, you know, our our Jim Crow laws and our systemic racism. Um, You know what? I want to talk a little bit about a couple people who were in the war locally here. Um, one of them being a really interesting guy, um, his name, sorry, (laughs) his name was Eluard, Eluard Luchel McDaniels. And, uh, he later in the war got to be known as El Fantastico, you know, the fantastic uh by by his spanish comrades because he was just like a brilliant shot with a grenade and he was like ambidextrous um but he was a a black man a communist um from san francisco so he was born in mississippi in 1912 he ran away from home at the age of seven that's by his own account and went to san francisco where he was taken in and raised by this radical photographer named consuelo canaga and so he lived with her he's this young black guy and like he completes high school he studies art at san francisco state college Um, And he soon after that got tied in with the labor movement and the Communist Party. So he's going all over the U.S. organizing, right? Um, And later, just a little bit later in life, he's going to join, you know, the communists in the fight against the fascists out in Spain. But he's going all over the U.S. helping to organize. Uh, He had a real knack for organizing um, sort of among races, which was really important back then because Jim Crow our deep history of horrible racism. Uh, It was difficult to do that kind of thing. Um, But he was going around the South helping organize labor down there and, you know, forcing, you know, people to understand that, like, you can't do segregated organizing. That's not how organizing works. Right. Um, And one thing he's known for doing is he was the guy who in Alabama he learned of the Scottsboro Boys. So have you ever heard of this case? No. Okay. So this was nine black kids, right? They were like, I I believe they were like riding a train and these two white women falsely accused them of raping them. And there was this whole long drawn out trial. And I think a bunch of them ended up going to to prison. Um, But the people who fought in defense of them were the NAACP and the Communist Party. Uh, And part of the reason that they learned about that is because he saw this case happening. He took a train immediately up to New York and he told both the NAACP and the Communists that the shit was going down, right? So super interesting guy. So he goes to Spain in, the, in June of 1937. He's assigned to a transport unit as a truck driver. Uh, then he worked with the, the Mac Paps. This was the uh, Canadian battalion. And then he was transferred to the Lincoln battalion, right? Um, but, it, you know, like I said, he became known as El Fantastico because of his uh, 
his prowess at throwing a grenade. That's a wild thing to be really good at. I've never heard of anybody being like good with grenades. Same. Yeah. I also didn't realize that it was like a thing. Like this shows you how much I pay attention to like war stories. But I just thought you like pull the little pin and throw it and hope it hope it goes where you want it to go. Well, I mean, <laughs> like, I don't ever think you also aim, right? I mean, yeah, kind of just, yeah. <laughs> I feel like being like if you were like good at baseball, it would be a really big. It would get you. It would go a long ways toward helping your grenade throwing. Your skill. Grenade game, yeah. yeah, definitely. Or like, or like cornhole. Ball. Maybe the Italians were really good at that. Cornhole too, yeah. I don't yeah. think you want to throw a grenade like a bocce ball. Like underhand? Yeah, like roll it really <laughs> softly. Backspin back the grenade? No. Yeah, no. Okay, well, this is why I've never fought in a war. <laughs> They're no, not rolling the, the grenades. Re- that's the one reason I haven't. You are not um, the Fantastico. No, I was not. Um, but he, um, you know, he was a... a a black man who who had had lived through a Jim Crow America, right? Um, and there were a number of of black men in this uh, battalion and black women actually who worked out there too. Um, there's another guy. Sorry, this is going to be another stop. Mm-hmm. Gonna find it. How do you pronounce his name? Elward. Elward. I think I messed up when I tried. What's this goddamn guy's name? Elward. I've never seen that name before. (laughs) Oh, here we go. There was another man in the Lincoln Brigade uh, named Oliver Law, and he was another black man uh, he's from Chicago, and uh, I believe he was like a lawyer out there, but he he came out to fight in the war as well, and he became, uh, it, in this war, the first black American to command white soldiers uh, for the U.S. in a military org. Now, obviously, it's not like a war sanctioned by the U.S. powers to right. fight in, but like that's like a pretty historic thing. Um. And Elward, he actually said something to the tune of, you know, he was he was really wary about returning back to the U.S. Uh, during Jim Crow, and from the front he wrote home, "I would rather die here than be slaved anymore." Um, so, it's, I, I think that's a really it's a different context to view this through uh, that we tend to forget about, uh, well, I think a lot of people do at least, the fact that the U.S. doesn't have much moral high ground in history at this point, uh, particularly right. with the way that they were treating uh, the black community, Native Americans, right? Um, there was a lot of racism and xenophobia. Um, but so, you know, Elward actually is buried uh, just outside of town here in Sacramento. If you were to drive out to Jackson, um, yeah, yeah, there's like, what's that highway called? It's right by that church where all those people got in trouble for getting COVID because they refused to not go there. Um, I can I can write in the show notes where that that cemetery is, but. Uh, I actually went and visited uh, his grave and another guy's grave in um, in what are the names of these towns? Uh, <laughs> in Woodland, uh, around the time I didn't, I forgot the name of Woodland. <laughs> it's getting. I don't hot know in why here, that. Was, I don't know why that gets me. 
But the there's something called the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archives. And they have asked in recent years for uh, Americans around the time of Memorial Day to go and visit uh, Abraham Lincoln Brigade uh, graves uh, throughout the country because these are folks that, you know, fought the good fight against fascism, yet uh, they're not recognized by our government. They're not recognized by much of anybody thanks to the Red Scare and thanks right. to the, the way that we decided to, to respond to communism, uh, which isn't even to say like, a lot of these guys weren't even communists. They just wanted to go fight fascism out there, right? Right. Um, but Elward was, and he was a great guy. And, you know, he was fighting the good fight out there. Um, so I visited his grave and then an another guy in Woodlands. Uh, and, you know, you're supposed to put a little flower down, which was kind of kind of cool. But the, the funny thing about this is after this war took place, you know, a lot of these guys, you, they go back to the, the U.S., uh, either you're wounded early and you go back or you come back uh, after the uh, League of Nations kicked out uh, all of the foreign fighters on, weirdly, only on the, uh, on the loyalist side, on the good side. Uh, and they let all of the, you know, 60,000 or whatever fascists from Italy and Germany stay in Spain. But they kicked out all of the Loyalist international fighters in 38, uh, or about a year before World War II started. Um, but so a lot of these Americans who fought in the a Abraham Lincoln Brigade go home, World War II starts, Pearl Harbor happens in 41. And so the US is like, oh shit, now let's go fight in this war against fascism because this is bad. Right. And they actually started giving aid to Russia and like, you know, now they're allies with the communists. So like all of these Abraham Lincoln Brigade guys were like, well, yeah, I want to go fight fascism again. Let's go. But the U.S. government and the U.S. people were still very wary of them. And they're like, oh, these are reds, right? These are communists. So these guys who want to go fight and help in World War II are even ostracized from within the military. Uh, U.S. intelligence had lists of names of all the people that were in the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, and they had a rule that were you in it, you were labeled as, and, and you might like this, uh, Skyler, PAF, which stands for Premature Anti-Fascist. The idea being that they fought fascists a little too early. They were a little mm. premature. <laughs> Yeah, they were ahead that's, of the game. That's a weird fucking label to put on somebody. Premature anti-fascist. This is wait, this is like a US government label put upon military like, label. Yeah. Uh-huh. This God. is fighting fascists before it was cool. Yeah. It, they were the hipsters of anti-fascism. <laughs> uh but like that's the that's the absurdity of of American capitalism. And I think that it's, it, it really illustrates well how deeply they don't want to see a workers' movement in this country. Um, and it also illustrates to me one of the greatest sort of, how do you put it, rhetorical coups the U.S. ever pulled off was finding a way to just inextricably intertwine capitalism with electoralism or like with like with democracy right um them saying like well capitalism means freedom when you look around this country and it most certainly does not mean that right, right. um yeah you know free elections are a great thing but Capitalism is not what brings that about. Right. And not only that, I think it's very effective in quelling voices, quelling the voices that really need to be heard the most. So anyway, they were premature anti-fascists. And um, yeah, so that carried on for a long time after. So anyway, these 3,000 Americans fought in this war. Uh, the Americans were really in it for two years, so 36 to 38 um they they fought in kind of 
I guess you'd say three or four major fighting rounds. Uh, the first one was in this valley called going to be another pause. Sorry. The first one was fought in this valley called uh, Harama, or right? that's how you, that's the sort of Anglicize, Anglicize uh, pronunciation. Uh, it started in February 1937. This was this valley that made it, so it was really, it was really important that uh, supplies from Barcelona, which is on the coast of the Mediterranean, right, can get into Madrid, which is the capital of Spain, for the, the loyalists. And so they had to keep the roads open there. And Franco and his people were trying to cut off those supplies. Uh, and so it was a very long, drawn-out battle. Uh, both sides claimed victory, but the, the Abraham Lincoln Brigade lost a whole lot of people during that. Uh, the second round of fighting was, I want to say it was out to the north and west of Madrid um, when Franco's forces were trying to surround uh, the city of Madrid. Uh, and again, that one ended up being a bit of a stalemate, uh, but they lost a lot of people during that. The third one was a few miles to the east of Madrid. And th at this point, you start to see that, it, you know, the, the fascists are, are surrounding that, the city. Uh, because they have all of the state-of-the-art uh, technology, these guns, uh, these tanks, these jets uh, from the Germans and the Italians. Really, the Germans' um, tanks and stuff were kind of the, the more impressive stuff. Um, and the Germans were already uh, practicing what ended up being things like the Blitzkrieg strategy that they did when they came across Poland and just took right. it a few days. So whereas like tanks used to be support all alongside all of the infantry, what they did with Blitzkrieg was just like send a zillion like tanks just flying at you at, at one little point in your line, break open your line create chaos on your side and then attack with everybody else. Uh, this was like one of their first rounds of practice with that sort of strategy. Um, and then the, the fourth sort of uh, fight that the Abraham Lincoln Brigade was in was more or less the retreat all the way to the, the Ebro River. Um, and that river was was really the last line between uh, Western Spain and, and the rest of Spain, and the, the rest of Spain that basically Franco's fascists were taking over. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think as you two know, uh, the, the Republicanists, the, the people who were for elections uh, lost the war, right? Um, but the, the last stand was was in upper northeast uh spain which really makes sense because barcelona there are two areas that are really interesting in spain one being barcelona uh where they speak catalan and another being basque country which mm -hmm. is up in the north uh just between it's kind of in these mountains right where where france and spain meet um and they're all fiercely fiercely fucking independent they all demand freedom like up in Basque country, they have this this one town called Guernica. I don't you you might have heard of it, and it was considered kind of the heart of the Basque people. And in this town, they had this oak tree, this historic oak tree, and these oaks like live almost forever, right, for centuries, squillions of years, okay. and squillions. And so the this. Ever since the Middle Ages, like the medieval times, they would actually have kings come up and swear underneath this Guernica or this, uh, yeah, Guernica oak tree that they uh, are saying, like, you know, we acknowledge your freedom as your own people, blah, 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 right? So um i don't know those are two really interesting areas it makes sense to me that um 
that Barcelona was sort of the the last stand uh, out there. But Guernica, I think you you might know, um, this was one of the first wars ever where, as a tactic, a an attacking side just tried like bombing an entire fucking city all the time, like just all the time, right? Uh, and the, one of the first places they tried that was in this small town called Guernica, and it's a small town, so they obliterated the fucking town. Um, and like people survived, but it's because they ran into like the fields outside of town. Um, weirdly, the tree survived, so the oak, the Guernica oak, survived. Um, oh. But they uh, they tried that there. And then they decided to like try that in Madrid and they realized in larger cities that strategy just, just didn't work. Not only did it not work, it turned the entire Western world against Franco. So he kind of stopped doing it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. It, to me, it's like kind of a, a really interesting, beautiful, like stand against fascism this war. We had 3000 Americans that, you know, really just put their hearts on and like bodies on the line for it. And it's, it's just really beautiful. Um, this, this, uh, Merriman guy, he ended up, uh, dying, uh, as they were, uh, fleeing back to the Ebro river. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess a lot of people died. A lot of Americans died in this war. Um, but I don't know. I guess that's, do I have more to add there? Do you guys have any questions? I feel like I just got like a, a history lesson that I don't have, I don't know if I have any questions, but it's all stuff that I'm just like, like I'm, I'm, act, I'm taking notes while you're talking. I don't know if I'm actually going to go back and look at right. any of this, but um. I think it's interesting just sort of like the, and you mentioned this in the beginning, like the similarities um, to what we're experiencing in our current political climate to like people who are just like fucking done with fascists and they're like, here, I'm going to do something about it. You know, in this case, it's a little different, but you know. I mean, it's always different and from country to country. And fascism takes different iterations, too. Sure. Yeah. So what... Okay, so I do have a question. What in the... What... How did you end up here? Like, what was it... Because I know you were reading a book, right? You were listening yeah. to a podcast? No. What was it... So, I mean, I've always... Every like, every like, teenage dude in America, I think, reads a little bit of Orwell, and so I think that that's kind of where this all began, because um, I think when I was in high school, I read *Homage to Catalonia*, which is George Orwell's account of the Spanish Civil War, um, and I don't think I really followed up too much with it throughout the years after that there's some really interesting figures that like they're just figures in the leftist circles now have you ever heard of a woman named dolores ibarudi or ibarudi mm. i don't um, think so nope they called her la passionaria right the passion flower and she was this communist young communist woman from Basque country that like ever since her grandma died she only wore black she was just in mourning for the rest of her life and uh very goth and she um was this she was really the heart of the resistance against the fascists during this war uh she was a communist elected official uh in Madrid and she was known for giving these very impassioned speeches. And one of the speeches that she gave, which became a rallying cry um, for the Republic throughout the war, but it, but it really is uh, a leftist term that you hear everywhere. Even our local band, uh, punk band, 
Las Pulgas, I believe they have a song called, uh, well, I'll say, say it in a second. So she said during one of her great speeches, it's better to die on your feet than to live on your knees, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then as after she said that, she said, no pasaran, or no pasaran, right? Like they shall not pass, you know? She was the Gandalf of communism. Sounds <laughs> like it. In the 1930s. Yeah. You know Wonderful. how much I love a Lord of the Rings joke. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never made that connection until today. So, But, you know, the, the, No Pasadan is like, it, that's one of the titles, I think, of a Las Pulgas song. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's sort of reverberated through, you know, through time uh, since then. Um, so I that figures like that always stick with you right she's like almost like a Gev che guevara type figure um and then you know just on top of that i uh i heard about i i you know on memorial day i don't really do too much but like i saw that uh this write-up from the abraham lincoln brigade saying like hey you know We've got, we've confirmed where like a number of these, uh, these graves of these fighters in the Spanish Civil War are throughout the, the US. Um, and the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, I think at least one of the people running it today is based out of Canada where, you know, they're less virulently anti-communist. Um, so he was like excited to hear from me asking where a couple of the graves might be nearby here. Um, they don't have, I believe, a publicly available map because some fucking fascists would probably go out and deface, you know, people's graves and stuff. So, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, no, I actually got to go out to two of them and like that was very special to me. Um, and then after that, I started, I remembered, you know, this, this war that I'd read about all those years ago and I started reading more and more up on it. And I, it got me to thinking about the way that our historians choose to write our history in our country and the way that obviously we've been talking about this for decades too, why people choose to put what they put in our uh, high school history books or whatever, you know? Um, I don't recall ever hearing about Americans in the Spanish Civil War. Right. Yeah, def I mean, definitely not. And so, I, you know, I, I think as we collectively as a country gain that leftist consciousness, the class consciousness again, uh, I think it's important for us to remember who some of those really exciting people at the beginning were. And they were, the, I think there's a lot of bravery involved in what they did. Um, Absolutely. You know, they they ignored the threat of a nine thousand dollar fine and you know to to go out and fight <laughs> yeah. this war, and not only that, when they came home they were blacklisted, you know. Right. Um, so, so our buddy from San Francisco, like he came back and was like you know working on the docks and stuff, but he got blacklisted out there because you know he was known to be a communist. Um, and a lot of these guys, this just chased them around for the rest of their lives. And like I said, even the guys that fought in World War II. Um, and I just really think it's time we start to question that and question. Uh, I, I like to question boomers who are very anti-communist. Uh, I know that my mom, when she explains socialism to, to folks out in Tennessee, because she lives in Tennessee, uh, which that in and of itself is no easy task but part of what she does is say well communism's bad but socialism's good and i'm kind of like well, well let's talk about this mom <laughs> and let's talk about where this this you know logic right. came from right right um and i i think it's important for us to demystify uh the the c word you know five years ago i couldn't i couldn't say i was a journalist uh who was a socialist right um you still can't say you're a journalist who's a communist today and like i i think we should continue to try and demystify that terminology mm -hmm. yeah of, I, I think it's good work to do for sure yeah a lot of leftists might say like just use the term marxist or something but it's like ah, let's just bring it full 
Let's go whole but hog. A lot of those terms are are pretty, and they're obviously not. They're not synonymous, but they are linked pretty inextricably. Yeah, I mean, didn't Marx say that socialism is the, sort of the the roadway to communism? Yes, I yeah. like yes. Yeah. So far as my understanding is that communism is kind of the end goal for of uh, Marxism. Mm-hmm. And and you know, like over history, we've <laughs> seen a few communist iterations that. Are, are we laughing at the cat? I've, on the drum set? <laughs> Betty is losing her mind <laughs> back there, and and it caught my eye right when you probably had a very important point to me. I did. I think I, I think I can find it again. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna stop looking at her. <laughs> Please ignore Betty. What were we talking about? I know communism. Uh, we were talking about. Uh, it was like marxism ultimately i'm sorry socialism ultimately oh yeah i think what i was going to say was over the course of history we've seen a few iterations that called themselves communism in certain nations that did not come out great and were obviously i mean totalitarian regimes that leaned away from open and free elections things like that um I think it's still still very worthwhile to fight tooth and nail for worker solidarity throughout the world. Yeah. It's still still deeply important to work toward a system that thinks beyond capital and is egalitarian and allows literally everybody to to have a full rich life and i also know that this current iteration of capitalism uh, particularly in our bastardized uh, iteration in the u.s it's not only killing so so many people it also is destroying our environment um and i think the fight against capital in that regard is is profoundly just and i don't think there's any other way to look at that yeah, I mean, I don't. I also think that you can't, you can't go, you can't say things like, "Oh, well, communism's never been done correctly in countries where they've tried it or whatever." It's, it's not, it's disingenuous to say that without taking into account that, like, the CIA has been intentionally fucking those situations up every time they happen for yeah. decades and decades and decades, right? Absolutely, like capitalists have. Capitalist governments like ours have a vested interest in not allowing communist governments to succeed, right? Yeah. Capitalists hate, they hate socialists. They hate the left. They hate communists. They hate, capitalists hate the capital L left more than they hate fascists. And we see it time and time again. Have you ever heard of Operation Gladio? No. Negative. Negative. Okay, so not only did the U.S. refuse to fight the fascists in the Spanish Civil War, after World War II, we win, right? The, 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 the capitalists and the communists work together to defeat the fascists, right? After World War II, in a lot of these countries where fascism was falling, the communists had really, really high social capital. You know why? Because they were the ones who fucking fought them in the streets. You know, the capitalists aren't doing that. The right. bitches. So the, the communists have really high social capital. The capitalists are terrified that, you know, in elections, the communists are going to gain power within their country and that, you know, the workers will have power there. And so they start something, the U.S. and the U.K. start something called Operation Gladio, where they basically, as they left Europe after World War II, they would, like, bury, like, entire, like, bunkers of weapons, and they would pick a few fascists left in those countries who, like, weren't, you know, killed or thrown to prison, and they would work together. This is the CIA work together with those fascists and say, hey, if the communists take over in these countries, we want you to know that there is, we will support you to fight that and that there is a cache of weapons for you, you know, in X, Y, and Z spot. So it's like 
you know, a lot of people might think that when I say that, that, that the capitalists, and by that I mean the Republicans and Democrats, hate the left more than they hate fascists, that like, well, that's an intense thing to say, Kempa, like that, that's, I don't know, I find something to back that up. No, like look at Operation Gladio, that's exactly what right. was happening there. Yeah. It makes me sad. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I like reading about this stuff. And like, you like the figures, right? Like, like La Passionaria, um, she is like your Guevara. She is like your sort of Castro. And it's, it's always interesting to, to read about those folks. I like to, I love listening to like folk music about people like that too. Um, there's a, a lot of sort of like leftist American folk singers that uh, wrote, uh, I believe there's a song about the Battle of Harama. Um, and, uh, you know, these were songs that you couldn't sing in Spain, but as soon as Franco died in like 70, I think it was 75, these like American folk singers would go to these like, just like, arenas full of crowds in, in Spain and these you know, these folks didn't speak English but like they they were able to sing these sort of songs right uh, which mm -hmm. is just it's super cool people would like uh, spirit these vinyl records into Spain you know while he was still the dictator there and like talk this stuff up because that's how this works you know there's it's almost like um, these these it's the verbal storytelling where, you know, you might not have the power of the history book, but you do have the power of song, you know, uh, which I think is really profound and important in things like this. I feel like I'm left with this, like, if I need to find some YouTube videos on this stuff, like I do, and the, like, this is serious. Like I, it is a it is an interesting story to me. One I think that deserves obviously more attention than the American education system has has given it. Um, and I like your story about like contacting whatever the organization was about like visiting Alba. Yeah, it's Alba. the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archives. Obviously, it's an acronym that also uh, well, I guess it's like the first four letters of all the set day where all the Americans were trained. I don't know. It's, it's, I, I thought it was a clever name. I like that there is even like here, even in our uh, like special episodes, there is even an opportunity for a bit of a call to action to like reach out and potentially go like visit graves in spaces where you know wherever you find yourself and um because that is i don't know in like culturally um we put as the mexican we put a lot of energy into death and like memorializing people and i like that potential to like honor a person for what was really like that's a that's a lot there's a lot of i guess sacrifice and i yeah. like i say that and i guess i have like a reaction to that because it's not like fourth of july wave the american flag sacrifice that i'm talking about but like legit this shit was like their lives were impacted like the blacklisting story right and not that veterans aren't important and all of that. We're going to get hate mail because I said that. I know what you're saying, though. It's different. Like, all of most of the military action that I feel like I can conjure up, like, in my lifetime is all in service of just pretty blatant American imperialism. Right? Imperialism, mm -hmm. right. And so you get kind of desensitized and kind of to a point where you're like, like, you know, what I guess I don't hate the troops, but I'm not like celebrating these actions, right? Uh, right. And so it is like you kind of, I feel like, I don't know, at least like I 
kind of get to a point where you're like, oh, like there are like, like I can't remember the last time we like went to war because it, it was the right thing to do, you know? And so right. it is interesting to like hear stories about people who saw some bad shit happening, saw that nobody else was doing anything about it. And we're like, all right, well, I'm going to go put my life down to stop this shit. You know, I, like that's yeah. not that. Yeah. Like I, that's not the usual, uh, I don't know, like American experience with war, at least it's not in my lifetime, you know? Yeah, yeah. There is something about it that feels like notable in a different way. Like this, like that kind of service, is not about like power and control it's about equity like and that right. and that feels like it's worth some special attention i guess mm -hmm. and it's not i mean you know i've said this a couple times now like these are this is not a story honestly i don't think if you had if you hadn't have brought it up in such a way, like I wouldn't have even paid attention to it. Like, have I heard of like the Lincoln brigade before? Yeah. If someone was like, what is it? I'd be like, I don't know. Yeah. And like the, the funny thing too, is I know that there's, we have like a lot of died in the wool leftists who are very well read, who listen to the pod. And this episode might sort of be a shrug for them. But I think there's a lot of listeners that, and it's most listeners maybe, that haven't really thought too much about this war or this fight. Um, and I think it's interesting. It's just one other thing that I think the older you get to, the more into history you get. Right. Well, yeah. it's also, I mean, I think this is an easy one to kind of, it, it's so analogous like we're coming out of like the spanish flu right so like this thing has just devastated the population and then we have rising fascism kind of coming right out of that you know and it like it's it's not i guess what i'm saying is it's not super fucking hard to draw a parallel between that and then exactly what is happening right now totally know? yeah um I, I wanted to make one other. So it, just uh, so people know, the my dog is doing everything she can right now to make noise over here. <laughs> I'm really sorry. She's like scratching herself and like there's like a little bell ringing as she does it. And now she's like drinking water in my face. Um, so a couple things. One place to find more about the Abraham Lincoln battalion slash brigade just call them the brigade uh is the abraham lincoln brigade archives uh that's at albavolunteer.org um and you can read so much up on them and up on different people who are a part of it um there were some really smart people and people who were like god damn it olive um and if it's people, not olive it's semi yeah <laughs> and right. people and, or Betty. And, or Betty. Yeah. Or, or Squid. Uh, squid is not allowed in here when I record. But people who really cared about the movement and cared about documenting it. And like, I wonder if there's some small part uh, of them that realized that uh, the American government, the American historians wouldn't be documenting this for them. Right. So uh, all the volunteer.org is really cool. The other guy I visited over in Woodland, his name was Earl Frederick Vale. Um, he's got, his daughter wrote this beautiful long piece at albavolunteer.org um, about, you know, she had a very not great relationship with him, but um, she really fleshes his life out. And like, there's, there's write-ups on it where I walked by his old house in Sacramento a few days ago and just kind of sat there and thought about it, you know? Um, uh, another, another thing that's close to home with this story is, I don't know if you've heard of Michael Israel, but he was, uh, he was a local guy um, who went out and fought in Syria with the People's Defense Units. And he died out there just a few years back. Um, young guy, I think he was like 27 uh, when he passed. But 
he was he was tight in a lot of the leftist circles around here and one of the reasons he went out there is because he was friends with a man named Delmer Berg. Delmer Berg was the last living member of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade uh, and he had all sorts of stories for him on kind of what it was like out there and and that's kind of I think Michael was somewhat inspired by by the Spanish Civil War uh, to go out and fight in Syria you know um, so I there's actually local folks that we could have on this show to talk more about that so I think that might be interesting uh, but this stuff, it can carry on for, for generations, uh, even if our history books won't allow it. And, and I think there's so much power in oral history, even though oral history can be imperfect. And I know there's imperfections in the shit I said, so sorry, everyone who knows this front to back today. Um, and in, you know, in the music and, and things like that. And, and even in a Hemingway novel. So, um, I don't know. Thanks for letting me rattle on about this today and drink some Spanish wine and drink yeah. that wine. Yeah. Thanks for, uh, thanks for bringing this man. This stuff is super interesting and it's nice to kind of, to get to have a conversation about it and hash it all out. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I had my coffee because I wasn't, <laughs> I was like, Oh man, this is like a lot. Of, I gotta take some notes. I was right. like rattling on too. I hope this like translates well. I, I'm, <laughs> every time we do a special episode and we change format, it's like, it's always a little bit of a, a gamble. So we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, um, the other, you know, the other nice it. things about, yeah, doing these Patreon episodes is that we can skip the pitch because if you're listening to this, you're already a patron and already we, bought in we appreciate and love you for that and thank you and this episode is sort of an extra thanks from us to you um for helping our, us out our comrades if you will exactly mm. yeah heard that yeah i don't know do you guys do you you want to go through the social media stuff no not at all let's no? just call it <laughs> let's just call it all right awesome yeah, yeah. Good. i'm i'm fully into it all right they well, all they know if they're listening to this they know they know yeah thanks everyone and like i'll i'll leave some links out there too for people if you want to know more about this war. yeah oh. cool all okay, right bye -bye. well thanks again dave all right Anytime. all right all right all right